Chief. So with that, I just want to get right into this so we can move along. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Stephen Coe, the Voice of the People. He's a Senior Research Scholar, Director of the Program for Public Consultation for the School of Public Policy at the University of Maryland. Uh, and he is also the founder uh, and president of uh, Voice of the People. So it's my pleasure to introduce Steve. Thank you. Uh, let me just give you a little background. Um, for more than 20 years now, we've been working at the Program for Public Consultation and School of Public Policy to try to improve the communication between the public and policymakers. It was prompted by some studies we did that found the policymakers didn't have a very good understanding of, of public opinion. Now, we found, though, that in trying to improve this communication, standard polls were not always adequate to the task. For one thing, often the public didn't have very good information the early polls we did back in 1995. Uh, the majority said we're spending too much on the foreign aid. And we asked, how much of the budget do you think goes to foreign aid? And the median estimate was 20% of the budget. <laughs> uh, we said, well, how much do you think it should be? And the median response was, oh, let's really be tough. Let's cut it back to 10. Uh, and then we said, well, how would you feel if it were 1%? And hardly anybody thought that was too much. Another problem we found with standard polls is that when you ask people questions in isolation, you often get what seemed like a coherent <coughs> response, such as, do you want to cut the deficit? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's good. Do you want to raise taxes? Do I want to raise taxes? Well, no, not really. No, no, I'm not. <laughs> do you want to cut spending in this area, this area, this area? Well, not really, not really, not really. Not really. <laughs> so the public's really just in incoherent baby, they just don't understand and they you know inputs and outputs and everything like that. So we developed a method that we call a policy making simulation, uh, where people go through a process where the goal is to put them in the shoes of a policy maker. Uh, and they're, they're given a briefing on the issue, so they have basic information. They're presented the policy options that are in play, and they evaluate pro and con arguments. Uh, that are the pro and con arguments in play, and then ultimately they make recommendations, often in the context where they have to deal with trade-offs. Turns out, by the way, when it comes to the budget, they are able to deal with the budget and they do cut the deficit uh, several hundred billion dollars. Um, the content of the policy making simulation is uh, reviewed by um, uh, Special staffers from both parties, as well as uh, various <coughs> outside groups that uh, have strong views on the issue and are participating in the discussion. Of this so, uh, a topic for today: uh, one, one of the, the uh, surveys that we've done is uh, on social security. Now, um, one other point, and this is where the voice of the people comes into the picture. We were generally doing national samples, um, and uh, maybe a thousand or so, uh, and we got more requests. Well, why don't, what about the specific states? What about the specific districts? And the idea of the citizen cabinet is that ultimately we'll have a large panel called the citizen cabinet, but with a few hundred in every district that will go through these processes, these policy making simulations that can ultimately make recommendations to the, to the member of Congress. Uh, we are basically in the, the startup demonstration phase, as you might say, and uh, we are uh, uh, we have a fairly large sample and coverage of more than 488 states um, on the, uh, this uh, particular survey. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the sample is primarily drawn from the Nielsen Scarborough uh, pool, uh, as in the Nielsen families. Um, and uh, the total number of respondents is 6,388. Uh, the margin of error nationally is uh, uh, 4 percent. And then for this fiscal run, we have five states, California, Florida, New York, Ohio, Texas. Earlier, we did uh, three other states, Maryland, Oklahoma, and Virginia. And you'll see those broken out uh, in, uh, as we go along. We ordered them, um, remembering uh, in, the, in the presentation on the slides, from the, the most uh, Republican to the most Democrat, Oklahoma at the top and New York at the, at the bottom. So as part of this uh, um, uh, presentation, we, we gave them a briefing. 
Uh, this is all done online, by the way. Uh, and uh, they got a uh, you know, basics of the program, the background, the amount of, ben of benefits, the progressivity of benefits, all these, you might imagine, different voices that, that, uh, that we vetted this thing with had different um, things that they want to emphasize. We try to include everything uh, that's relevant. Uh, and then a briefing on the social security shortfall, the time frame, the magnitude, the causes. And we present them graphs that look like this. So we call it. We don't know where that's coming from. It's coming from the not our computer detection. So they get, we get an explanation of the ratio of active workers to social security rate retiree is going down, that uh, the Americans are living longer, that uh, the projected population of elderly people is, is been rising and is projected to rise further, and that if no action is taken, then monthly benefits will go down from um, uh, in 2033 from current dollars $1,294 down to $1,023 in, in average uh, benefits. Um, so, we present them four general options for addressing the shortfall, reducing benefits for higher earners, raising the for retirement age, raising the cap on uh, accepted to the payroll tax, raising the payroll tax rate. However, we, are, we also want to look at other <coughs> options for reform that are in play, and uh, one is increasing the minimum benefit, another is increasing the benefit for the very old, and two alternatives for uh, modifying the cost of living adjustment. Discussed. All of these are ones that the SSA has uh, scored, which is really critical, as you'll see. As you'll see. We, they, we want them to have this uh, trade-off experience that each thing costs something, but they get some benefit from it. And, and so they are told what the scoring is, how much of the shortfall is it, covered. Uh, so the procedure is that we first present them the option, then they're presented the pro and con arguments. They, they give a kind of uh, a soft evaluation, how would you feel if it were to happen? And then at the end, all of the options are presented in one big spreadsheet. And they're each the, the scoring for each option is presented. Then there's a little bubble at the top that, that tells them how they're doing relative to the shortfall. So they make a, an adjustment, uh, okay, you covered, you reduced benefits for higher earners, okay, this is how much you covered, oh, they, they increased the minimum benefits, okay, that's because the coverage is reduced and so on. So they're getting this constant feedback. So what I'm going to be showing you is primarily the, how people responded to the arguments and what the final recommendation was it was presented as a recommendation. So, um, first stage, then the, the, the options, the value of course on arguments and so on. Um, so, reducing benefits for higher earners. The option is to reduce the degree of increases in benefits for those with higher and higher earnings. It, this, this, it, this is not the same as uh, um, uh, means testing where you actually you get benefits at higher uh, levels. You still get higher levels, but not as high. It bends the curve downward uh, for those in, in higher income groups. And the argument in favor, uh, you have the arguments, by the way, because I'm not going to be able to read them all, but in, in your materials, if you'd like to, if you want to just you know, follow along and see what, uh, uh, more close, closely what's, uh, what the arguments uh, uh, were. But just to start with, when we have to come to such a pretty short fall one way or another, wealthy retirees have other ways to fund their retirement, expenses and savings, and right now they get benefits even higher than other people, this gap should be reduced, and their benefits are more like others, it's only fair. And 62% find that convincing. <coughs> a slight majority of uh, Republicans, large majority of Democrats. And as you can see, uh, you'll see throughout, to the extent that we might find surprise that there isn't that big of a difference between the states, uh, between Oklahoma, which is the reddest state, and New York, which is the bluest state. There's, uh, it's, it's, it's actually pretty, pretty similar. So, on the con side, well, many of the proposals for reducing benefits based on income will end up hurting some people who are part of the middle class, particularly people in areas of the country where the cost of living is high. We should not change Social Security in a way that forces seniors to lower their quality of life. Well, that does really well. 77% find that at least something convincing, and very little difference between Republicans and Democrats on that. And up and down the line, you get a robust effect. So, the con argument is more persuasive. But what do they do in the end? 
And then final recommendations, three quarters re reduced benefits for the upper 25%. And then very little difference between the parties. It, the Democrats do it more, even though this is often thought of as a Republican proposal, um, uh, than, the, than, than the Republicans. But still, you get quite a robust majority going for reducing the benefits of the top 25%. Top 40% drops off steeply down to 31% overall. And we tried 50% as well. And that uh, gets to about half of it, these numbers. So it's, uh, it's, it's clear where, where they think, uh, what, where they're comfortable. Raising the full retirement age, and the option is to continue to raise the full retirement age two months each year beyond 2027, when it reaches age 67. Um, and um, we give them a, a chart to show how that would, how that would look like, you know, this, uh, uh, how, how it's currently on a trajectory to 2027, that will be flat now, and you could go on up to 2034 for 68, and uh, further to 69. So. So the argument in favor of raising the retirement age, uh, people at 66 are much healthier now than in the past, and so on, I can't read them all, but uh, two-thirds find, find that argument convincing a very bipartisan uh, view on this. The argument against it does a little better, and it's also quite bipartisan. By the way, it's very normal for majorities to find both the pro and the con argument convincing. It's like they're saying, oh yeah, that's a good point, and then they hear the other side, oh, that's a good point too, right? <laughs> Which uh, we think is a good side. It means they're deliberating. They're not, not just approaching this with a bias, and they're really thinking it through. So the argument against that raising the retirement age is unfair because many workers in their 60s still hold physically demanding jobs, blue collar jobs, retail jobs, and it's already a stretch for the retirement age to go to 67, it shouldn't rise any further. And that does better than the, than the, the, the pro argument. But when it comes down to it, and they're dealing with that trade-off with that little bubble staring at them, and they know that means, otherwise 23% cuts in benefits, 79% go for raising it to age 68, and hardly any difference between the parties and hardly any difference between the state. Age 69, yeah, sharp drop, age 70, about an even further drop. So first, you know, they, they, they do distribute the pain where you can. Raising or eliminating the cap on income subject to the payroll tax. Two options we explored. Raising the cap to 215000 That's what we wanted to say. Explored. Or eliminating the cap entirely. So there are, there's some really interesting dynamics. Pay, pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> um, the argument in favor of raising the cap does quite well. 73%, including two-thirds of uh, Republicans. People who are well off have benefited from all the great things about the American economic system. It's only fair they should contribute more and they can surely afford it. Remember this change. They will also get higher social security. <coughs> well, the con argument, in general, raising the increase in taxes is a serious mistake. Reduces the amount of Americans have to spend on the campus food, housing, clothing, and so on. Uh, you have to tax increase or the self employed. That does well, not quite as well. And, and it, it, it drops down particularly for, for Democrats, Republicans, and they're about the same for each one. So now, then we gave them the argument for eliminating the cap. And you would think that the argument for, for eliminating the cap would not do as well as not the base of the cap, right? But it doesn't. The incomes of the wealthy have been growing by leaps and bounds, while the incomes of the middle class have been stagnating. It's time for the wealthy to step up and do their part by helping to make Social Security secure. Besides it all, all that means that they pay the payroll tax all year like everybody else, not just the first part of the year. 82% find this convincing, including 75% of Republicans and 91% of Democrats. And now, watch this. The con, and this is the best argument we could get against eliminating the cap, was basically a dud. When the argument goes under 50%, we, we go that as a dud. <coughs> higher earners just saw their income taxes, investment taxes, and Medicare taxes increase, higher taxes discourage them from working and encourage tax evasion. We also have less money to make investments to create jobs and promote economic activity. This will hurt the economy. It, 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 even among Republicans, the, the pro argument got 75% and the con argument got 54%. So that, that was, that's pretty striking. It's un unusual that you get an argument that's really been well honed in the, the Republican spirit and it just doesn't, doesn't uh, 
So what do they do in that? For those who raised or eliminated, 88%. So in 85, including 85% of Republicans, 92% of Democrats is the most popular idea. And of those, 59% eliminated uh, the cap entirely, including 54% of Republicans. Now this is interesting, because we did this in 2013. In 2013, only 52% supported eliminating the cap. That's gone up to 52%, uh, 59%. So Republicans have stayed rather steady. The shift is mostly in Dems, and a big shift in independents. So something that's really curious is going on here. Raising the payroll tax rate, argument in favor is quite well. Social Security is a good investment, provides a foundation, and so on. 69% quite that convincing, including 62% of Republicans, as well as 78% of them. The con argument, that's about the same. So it's higher for, for uh, the, uh, Republicans. Raising the tax rate is bad for employees, especially people who live paycheck to paycheck. Any increase in the use of less to spend, less to save for retirement, bad for employers, but increases increase their costs, and so on. Um, and uh, it's very bipartisan, both <laughs> the pro argument and the, 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 the con argument. In the end, what do they do? <coughs> Three quarters raise it from 6.2 to 6.6. .6. Here again, when you go up to 6.9, big drop off down below half. Um, and at, at 7.1, it goes to 6.2. Uh, <coughs> Recalculating COLAs. Uh, we had an argument in favor of chain CPI, and we'll go into a detail in a minute of time here. But a very homogeneous response, with two, almost two thirds finding the argument convincing. The con argument does a little bit better. The idea that senior citizens are going to closely monitor the cost of marriage, which is on the list, they can sort But we also presented the argument for basing the co COLA on what the elderly buy. Oh, and that does really well, 80%. Find that argument uh, and the argument against it does considerably less well. So that in the end, they can't do it every which way. So we just say that when their final recommendations, they couldn't choose both of them. Uh, they had to choose one or the other, or or no change. And in that context, basically there was no consensus. Change CPI did a little bit better than what the elderly tend to buy uh, as a basis. And there's remarkably little difference between the parties in, in, in this, this basic you know, lack of consensus as to uh, um, uh, for any, any particular change. Raising benefits, we look at raising the minimum monthly benefit for those who work 30 years or more from 800 to 1260 a month. The argument in favor did extremely well, including with the Republicans. Uh, the con did considerably less well, but still pretty well, almost two thirds including with 58% of Democrats. Uh, in the end, 58% did raise the minimum benefit for May 9th, 12, 16, but just under uh, half of Republicans <coughs> Republicans. Very little difference, uh, again, between the states. Uh, here, another interesting trend effect. There's been a substantial increase in support for raising the minimum benefit in 2013, only 47% overall uh, favored it, and all, all partisan groups have had substantial increases in their support for raising the minimum benefit. <coughs> Supplementing the benefits for the very old, increasing the benefits by 61 and 50 a month for those 85 and older. The argument in favor, oh wow, just knocks it out of the park, 80%. Well, that's grandma, she needs help. Um, you know, so you think, wow, here's another surprising effect. And the argument against it, oh, people should be you know, responsible for their needs and so on, go down their path more dependent, discouragement from saving. Not, not a good response, only half. So this looks like, oh wow, this is gonna be a real winner, right? But it's not. Only 45% in their final recommendations choose it. Now remember they're going through this list, and that, that bubble's falling them around, they're at the, the bottom of the list, and uh, they still haven't covered it, right? Or they, or they have, and this will, 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 will you know, raise it up. So that might have been a factor. So putting it all together, there are three, four uh, reforms that are really getting knocked out of the park, covered two-thirds of the shortfall, 
So they redu reducing the benefits for the upper 25 percent, raising the retirement age to 68, and raising the cap to 215, or eliminating it and raising the payroll tax uh, to 6.6 .6 or higher. And you can get basically three quarters or more in all of those categories. A lot of it in a very bipartisan effect. And then you have additional recommendations to eliminate the cap or and raise the minimum monthly benefit to get a more modest majority, but still, uh, uh, in most cases, by Carson. Um, and that covers 98% of the shortfall. So that's basically the picture. Now, one more really interesting thing, you're probably thinking to yourself, well, okay, those people who have incomes over 100000 they're not going to want to raise the cap. And I'm, then there are the people who have incomes. So that's maybe the explanation. Well, guess what? It's not the way you expect. Also, you might think of people who um, would be affected by the retirement age, um, more resistant to be than people who are grandfathered in. Well, here's the difference of it. To use the cutoff line, and people with under 50 and older, uh, above 50, um, are, are, are hardly different at all when it comes to raising retirement age uh, to at least 68. And then on raising the cap, people with incomes over 100,000, only a little lower than people with incomes below 100,000 who would not be affected by it. Um, and reducing the benefits for the upper 25 percent. Here you get a diff more of a difference. People with 100,000 or more or more are, are less supportive, but still you have two thirds overall. So if you want to go through the policy making simulation yourself, you can do so by going to bop.org. Um, it's an interesting experience. Um, and at the end, you can summarize your recommendations and send them off to your <laughs> member of Congress. <laughs> Um, or you can, if you get uh, um, uh, constituents who, who contact you and you know, have sort of a simplistic idea of what can be done about Social Security, you might want to direct them to try the simulation and summarize their recommendations and send them out to the Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Attractive option. 
it seems like a fairly low cost option. It will fall mostly on individuals who can probably bear some sort of a tax increase because they're better off than the rest. Um, and it solves a lot of the shortfall according to um, the actuarial math. But what it, what it doesn't acknowledge is that Social Security <coughs> payroll surpluses do not actually go toward Social Security at that time. They create more um, unfunded obligations uh, for the rest of the federal government and the taxpayer. Because, for example, right now, the Social Security Trust Fund has $2.8 trillion in assets, but the assets really are treasury bonds. And in order to pay, to pay those bonds, um, the government still has to either raise taxes or borrow in other ways. And, and that's what we're seeing today because we already have payroll tax shortfall. So I think then without that context of is that money really going to go to Social Security or will that money allow Congress to expand the budget in other ways while crediting the Social Security Trust Fund with more debt, but in the end, it doesn't make it any easier for us to repay those bonds down the road. Mm -hmm. um, that wasn't really reflected, so I think that um, if we included that, maybe individuals would make different choices, given that there is not a lockbox and those assets aren't really set aside for Social Security. Okay. <coughs> Can everyone hear me? Great. Very well. First, I would just really like to commend Steve and Voice of the People. I thought this was really, really excellent work, and I'm so thrilled to be on this panel to discuss it. Um, like Steve said, in a whole, it's really unusual to fully brief people, not only on details of pretty complicated options in a very simple, accessible way, but also the arguments for and against, which they did in a very, very balanced way. And that's a really a testament to the very careful work that you did in soliciting opinions on both sides of the aisle, among experts, and the fact that so many people found, you know, both the pro and the con persuasive was great. It showed that they were being open-minded, and it showed that they could really see both sides of the issue. So I mean, I think this was a very carefully structured work, and we should really take it seriously. And I'm really impressed. Um, and I found the findings really, really fascinating. And I think the bottom line to me in the findings was Americans like Social Security, and they are willing to pay more to strengthen it. And so I'd like to just make three observations on the findings. Uh, the first one on taxes. The tax options had very significant support, both raising the cap and raising the rate. That was significant support among both Democrats and Republicans. So for example, raising the cap, the most popular option had 88% support overall and 84% among Republicans. I think that surprises many people, especially in Washington, where they think that tax increases are anathema among Republicans. Obviously, the American people don't agree. Um, my second point is on benefits. There's substantial support for making the Social Security benefit formula more progressive. You know, we had three quarters support for trimming benefits among higher earners and majority support for increasing benefits among lower earners. And so that's an interesting finding as well. And then third, my third point is about the balance between taxes and benefits. You know, here in Washington, so much of the conversation is often Let's split the difference. Let's do 50-50. You know, in terms of Social Security, people often kind of have as their starting point, let's do 50% benefit cuts and 50% tax increases. Well, that's really arbitrary, and that is not at all reflective of where the American people are. The majority package, um, which did make the Social Security system almost solvent, 98% of the gap was filled, was 85% tax increases and only 15% benefit cuts. So, you know, think about that when you think about starting at a 50-50 point. That is not... You're not in touch with the constituents if that's where you're starting. So um, all in all, I'd just like to say, I, you know, <coughs> this is a weird political moment, and it is so wonderful to see the American people being common sense, constructive, and compromising. You know, I'd really love to see more of this, and I'm really excited to be part of it. Uh, well, thanks, everyone, for, for having me and for being here. The tough part about going third is Kathleen and Romina already said everything else. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let, let me reiterate that I think this is really an awesome poll that, um, or, or, or an awesome polling process when people get involved in this. We have our uh, own similar social security reform simulator. Um, you, can, you can visit it at socialsecuryreformer.org and it lets you go through the various options. And often we run it in town halls or in classrooms or elsewhere. And something I've found every time I've run one of those exercises, which is really similar to your findings, is every single group I've done it with, there's been majority support for a tax increase of some kind. And every single group I've done it with, and this is even more surprising to me, there's been majority support for a retirement age increase. Now, that's pretty funny because when you look in Washington, you hear that tax increases um, 
are, aren't enough to go on the right because the constituents will never support them. And raising the retirement age is, is you know, throwing grandma under the bus and the worst thing you can do if you're a Democrat. But it turns out the public, when they're confronted with choices and trade-offs, not when they're asked, hey, do you want to work longer, but when they're confronted with choices and trade-offs, and they understand we have an insolvent or a program headed towards insolvency, they're willing to make these tough choices. Uh, sadly, I, I think our political discourse is trying to pretend these tough choices don't exist, and that's a huge problem. Uh, speaking of huge, uh, it's a problem in the presidential debate. <laughs> uh, our Republican candidate for office is saying we don't need to touch Social Security. This is the first time in, in a number of years the Republican candidate has said that, that we can just reduce fraud and grow the economy. If you eliminated fraud, it would close about 3% of the total solvency gap. So of course, there's no way to eliminate fraud without, I mean, ever, but you'd also have to spend a lot more money. And there's no reasonable level of economic growth to get there. So this is, this is fantasy stuff. Um, and on the left, we're now seeing this weird debate over how much we should expand benefits for everyone. Again, uh, this is really a false promise. If you expand benefits, there's 60 million people on Social Security headed to 9 million. If you give them each just $100 a month, that's the size of the public government's entire spending in general outside of Social Security. If you give them each $200 more a month, it would double Social Security's insolvency gap. So, of course, we can expand and should expand benefits for people that need them. But this idea that we don't have to worry about solvency um, and we can focus on expanding benefits for everyone, it's just giving a false choice to the public. And, and I think what this poll shows is when you instead give the public the real choices, they understand the trade off. They can make smart choices, smart, smart decisions, uh, and hopefully folks in Washington will start listening to them a little bit. Okay. Everyone's very good on time today. Appreciate that. <laughs> um, so, so I'm going to follow up on, on Mark's point there for a second. Um, and we're, we're a few years away from the president putting change CPI into the budget to sort of perhaps pave the way for a broader grand bargain that would reduce social security benefits. Um, as Mark was saying, we're now done want to increase benefits and the GOP economy for the first time in a long time doesn't think it needs to be touched. Where, why have the urgency left? I have to object to the pairing back social security. I mean, I think pairing back the solvency gap yes. would be, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but obviously there's not a huge amount of support for, um, for yes. pairing back the benefits for the size of the program. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think there are so many competing priorities right now. There, there's a lot of urgency on obviously getting the economy, you know, the economic recovery to be even more robust than it already is to think about, you know, some of the more immediate problems that we face. But I do think that we should be paying more attention to solvency and if we're able to um, to address it, then we can, you know, uh, in the short to medium term, that we can phase in those changes more gradually. So I think I think it would be nice to be able to, you know, focus on this. But I don't think it's urgent that we have to do it today. It is, you know, the, the solvency, um, uh, the projected insolvency date is uh, two decades away. So we have some time to deliberate. You know, deliberate in the way that you ask the American people to deliberate. And I think we should take our time to come up with a really balanced and fair solution. Yeah, so I think that um, one problem is that while the insolvency date isn't that far away, about 18 years, and if you look at the CBO projections, it could come even sooner, it, uh, it does seem far off for people to consider that, especially within the myopia we observe in the Congress uh, every year, that you know, we focus on what's coming up in the next few weeks and not really even thinking about next year. So that's, that's definitely a problem. Um, then there was the financial crisis. Many on the right still believe that the best solution is some sort of a privatization plan, and so um, that doesn't really bring very well with the American people. They're still remembering how much they lost um, during the recession, and so that's another reason that there's no particularly compelling option uh, there, I think. Um, but I disagree that we have a lot of time to just deliberate, because I think many of the changes uh, that are being discussed in this simulation um, and that are included, there are other changes as well that could be made. They take time to phase in. I like to compare Social Security, um, kind of like the Titanic heading toward the iceberg. Um, if, if, if the radar is telling us there's an iceberg and we're heading straight for it, um, this program is too large to go, oh, let's just wait until, it, um, until we can really see it right there and then, and then we'll turn. Because at that point, it's too late and you're facing much, um, much more drastic changes, much higher tax increases that would have to be based in much 
uh, faster that could create economic problems that you might not otherwise have. And many of the options, like increasing the retirement mm -hmm. age gradually, not for individuals who are currently near retirement, but uh, further down the road, those options won't be there anymore. They won't really save any money until decades later, and we need money right now. And so what this is setting us up for is basically putting the entire burden on the tax side, which is not really sustainable because we, we have, overall we have almost a $20 trillion debt now, and healthcare is growing at an even, even more rapid pace than Social Security. So looking at the overall budget, um, we're not going to be able to patch up everything just by increasing taxes. So we're going to be confronted with very, very hard choices. Therefore, we should make uh, we should start the reform process now so we can face uh, changes and gradually. We're thinking back to reforms in 1983. We still haven't fully faced in the retirement age. Mm -hmm. It took 40 years to do that. <coughs> that's a pretty really long time, so those savings are taking a long time to materialize. We need to start sooner rather than later. But, you know, our co-chair, Liam Panetta, used to say you can either govern by leadership or you can govern by crisis. In 83, when we took Social Security, we governed by crisis. Mm -hmm. The Social Security Trust Fund actually ran out as far as the old age fund did. It was borrowing from the disability fund, and there was a due date. Uh, the problem this time around is the due date is far past. The actual due date, sometime maybe in 2034, if you believe CBO, 2030, is long after it's too late to fix it. And I actually don't agree it's a tax on the solution at that point. At that point, it's a general revenue tax. But at that point, Social Security can't exist as a self-contained program because the deficit will be too large, particularly when you consider we don't really want to touch anyone that's currently retired. We don't want to touch anyone that's near retirement. We want to phase in our policies. We want to phase in our tax increases. We really probably only have five or six or seven years to be able to do this before there's no choice to make money from general revenue. So um, the crisis isn't going to work this time. We need leadership. And a few years ago, we actually had some leadership. You know, I was I was privileged enough to work on the Simpson Bowles Committee Commission and the Hensley Large Super Committee. And although the Super Committee never came out with recommendations and the system those recommendations, as we know, were fully adopted by Congress and the President. Um, <laughs> I was really proud of the work that both commissions did on Social Security publicly and, and privately, and the types of negotiations and compromises that were made to ensure it be solvent for 75 years in a way that was pro-growth, that was fair, and that actually increased benefits for lower income folks. And, um, why is there such difficulty in approaching the problem. Um, basically, the, the, the strongest voices are organized groups that take the position to say, don't cut benefits or don't raise taxes. And the public is just sort of stuck there in the middle with the people in, 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 in both directions. And uh, any departure from those positions is heavily punished by by those groups. Any, any member of Congress who who goes contrary to the, 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 the dominant groups that they're aligned with is heavily punished. So then you bring the public into the picture, and they just don't see that you know as, as an either or. In fact, what they did, what 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 you saw that they did was they they equalized the pain across the different options. They tended to show the, the minimum step in each area but they distributed across all of the options. And this was uh, for people in, in both parties, and the Republicans raised revenues, and the Democrats uh, cut benefits. Um, so the, the problem is there, there is there is very little space within the discourse that goes beyond that, that polarization and, and, and has absolute positions. But the public's able to do that because it seems kind of self-evident for them that you're gonna have to. <coughs> But there are really very few voices out there that are that, 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 uh, that call for some kind of mixed uh, approach. Uh, drawing down a little further on Kathleen's points, uh, she said it was about 80 percent, 85 percent of the recommendations of the, the majority mm -hmm. work on the revenue side. I think about two thirds, and as I could fill two thirds of short call, two thirds of actual call was filled by revenue as well. Uh, I'm wondering, it, you know, you said not sort of 50. Place. But is is there a place where we should be looking where where the right mix is? I mean, I think this is a great place. I think this is what if, if you're looking at what your constituents want, this is what your constituents want. And I think you know it's something that people um, are really value. People really value Social Security. It protects everyone. It doesn't just protect older people. It protects you if you get a disability. It protects your children if you die. 
if we're all in it together and people really strongly support this approach and they are willing to pay for it. And so I think that, you know, starting, uh, you know, or even ending up somewhere like this would, would be a great thing. And I think it would be, you know, once you get beyond the politics, like you said, the extreme politics of it, I think that you see that this is something that people really value and people are really willing to pay for. Actually, I find that in polls that just ask the question cold, too. You, you do find majorities in favor uh, of eliminating the cap. So there, there is a kind of growing feeling that there's some uh, inequality in the American system, and, and there is some there is a, a growing toward a more, more progressive tax structure, but not entirely. There is also a feeling that everybody who gets in benefits should be putting something in, and thus there is support for increasing the payroll tax rate, which is a, which is basically. Sure. So, um, I think Kathleen is totally right that uh, the public supports paying more taxes in order to secure more of the social security, and we should we should allow that as part of the plan. And I think Romina is totally right that. Um, there's a finite amount of resources, and although it'd be impossible to ask the public to weigh all areas of budget against each other and get an accurate result, our leaders need to think about that. If we raise the payroll tax on every on top earners by 12.5%, that's going to take our top effective tax rate up to 55% or so. That leaves less room to raise taxes for everything else, whether it's infrastructure 
education or defense uh, or stuff tax reform. So I, I think what these polls can do really well is get the sense of the direction the American public wants to go in the area they're interested in. But it's not like policymakers actually have to make the decisions. They need to make them on a whole variety of, uh, of issues. They need to think about what are the economic growth effects of this plan? What are the distributional effects of this plan? What are the long term effects? Because a lot of these policy options will get us a bunch of money up front but may not do as much over the long term. And we need to weigh all these against each other. For example, we know folks want to raise the age to 68, but it's hard to think out 75 years. That doesn't necessarily mean that on a gradual path, we couldn't index the age to longevity. So, so 68 by 2050, and 69 by 2075, and you know. So next time you see a baby crying, it's because we have to work for more years. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think these polls are really important to help policymakers understand the direction of where they need to go. But they're going to have to negotiate and have to make some serious, tough, um, in some cases, very technical choices. So we've heard a lot in this campaign about manufacturing, um, even as the economy is moving more of a service economy, which doesn't mean that people are working less on their fees or that those jobs take less of a toll on their bodies. But is that something that policymakers should be taking into account? I mean, we're talking about these changes in 2025. How much does the changes in the economy and how people work, how should that be playing a role in the way policymakers are deciding? I mean, I think it's related both to how people work and how long people are living. I think especially in a retirement age conversation, you hear a lot of people say, well, people are living longer. And it's true. Many people are living longer, and it's true that on average people are living longer. But I think averages like that mask some significant differences both in health and in longevity. And so if you look, if you go back 50 years um, and you look at male life expectancy compared to now, a 65-year-old man can, on average can expect to live six years longer. A 65-year-old woman now can expect to live three years longer um, than 50 years ago. And that's great. That's fantastic. Um, but that average masks a huge, huge diversity among people's experiences. Um, and so when you're talking about an across-the-board change like raising the retirement age, you have to think about that because this is a change that would affect everybody. And when you look at the top half of earners, that's where that those gains in life expectancy have come. If you look at the bottom half, no. There's been almost no change in the past several decades on the, on the bottom half of the income distribution. And I think that's really important for policymakers to keep in mind when they say, well, everyone can work longer. Well, the health and longevity at the low end just don't really support that, um, that assumption. And I think it's particularly, you know, there's been a lot of press, particularly some really great reporting in the Washington Post especially, um, on the decreasing life expectancy among lower income women, particularly lower income white women. And so I think you have to take that into account. Look at what's happening to real people who are, you know, well up into the middle class who are facing worsened health and worsened longevity compared to um, what, what they were, what their parents and grandparents were doing. I, some of these um, individuals who find themselves in this position, lower income individuals with hard labor jobs, um, they end up in the Social Security Disability Insurance Program before they transition into the retirement program. And that helps with a lot of improves the progressivity in this area. Even if you increase the retirement age overall, because you have a much larger uh, proportion of lower income, hardworking labor uh, individuals in the disability program overall, you're not really changing um, the program that much because those individuals can't work to 66 or 67 already. Uh, many of them don't make it to 62, so it's, it's in their 50s where you know they've, they've had a lifetime of plumbing and carrying bathtubs around where they just can't do it anymore, and that's where that program comes in. But that program, too, is facing a lot of problems and needs reforms, and that is a program that's even less talked about because it, expect, it affects a smaller population, uh, individuals with disabilities, <coughs> Is, 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 I guess, not as part of a political topic than um, retirees. More people find themselves part of that population. And um, what is ha what's happening there, you also see uh, funds being transferred to the different programs. So again, I encourage looking at the broader perspective. Um, if we have a reform disability program that can better serve those individuals who can't work to the current retirement age or higher retirement ages, um, we can reform it such that we can um, reduce the waiting lines that will make it a lot easier and make it more of a viable option for individuals. Um, 
and we should look at the programs in tandem and how they serve those populations when we think about whether this is going to really hurt lower income um, individuals who might not have as long of a life expectancy. I think overall it makes sense to do work on averages when it comes to this question um, because we are, this, it is simply unsustainable that the, the years during which individuals are collecting benefits on average, that's where the, where the large cost comes from, um, they keep ex expanding and the years during which individuals work are not and that is just not sustainable. So the indexing to life expectancy I think is absolutely necessary. So I, I think if you're considering whether to raise the retirement age, you need to ask two questions. Should we be encouraging people to work longer? And should we be adjusting the program benefits for everybody to account for growing longevity? Because retirement age actually does both. It's an across the board. You just raise the normal retirement age, it's an across the board cut. Anyone can retire at 62 still, you just retire with the same benefits. It's also an incentive and a signal for people to work longer. So when I look at those two questions, and the first, I say absolutely yes. Uh, life expectancy has gone up for most people, even when we have a few years of dips, life expectancy has gone up. People's average age of retirement has gone down over the last 60 years. There are still people in very tough physical jobs, but uh, you know, every decade there are fewer and fewer people in physical jobs and more in service and, um, and information jobs. So you look at, and by the way, we have an aging population which slows economic growth. And one of the ways to partially offset that is for people to work a few more months a year. So in that question, I lean towards heavily yes. If people can work longer, we should encourage them on the question of the across-the-board reduction or the across-the-board adjustment, uh, that's a tougher call. And how I look at it is this. It makes sense to raise the retirement age so on average benefits are, are adjusting for everyone if it's part of a progressive Social Security plan that overall protects or enhances benefits for low income and makes sure that people that are moderate income aren't really bearing many of the other costs. Because we know that we have to make some changes. If we do nothing, there's a 21% across-the-board cut. So those changes should largely be uh, on the top half and even top quarter of the population, in my opinion. I think if, if there was, if, based on the responses of the pro and con argument, if there was a formula that would um, ex uh, raise the retirement age for people who consider tasks and not so much to do their on their feet, uh, there probably would be support for that. Uh, it's just there really isn't a, you know, a, 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 a known way to, to make that differentiation. <laughs> and, and, Right now, we sort of do have a kind of band aid that, that has some of the same effect as you mentioned uh, through the disability program. I, just, I have two more quick questions I want to get through. Um, first of all, um, can you guys just sort of list some maybe other ways to shore up Social Security that one of the students' presentation of the number of the rock box or the George Bush guy? Are there other, uh, other policy options people should be looking at that? Maybe are even outside the program right like now. So one option is to fundamentally alter the nature of the program away from being a earnings related uh, benefit and a benefit formula that is based <coughs> on years worked and salary and during those years toward a flat benefit, uh, anti-poverty benefit that could serve the purpose of <coughs> keeping individuals out of poverty when they're unable to work, whether that be due to disability or due to old age, which is another form of disability. Reducing the benefits to the top 25% of the system. That's right, it will over time flatten out flatten the benefits. Um, it also gives people a predictable benefit that they can plan for. And I think decisions like if I'm a uh, office worker and I can work longer and maybe I enjoy my work more and maybe I want to work past 70 um, versus I'm a nurse and I just can't do it anymore and I want to retire earlier. Having a system <coughs> that allows for more personal savings, some of that could be facilitated by government sponsored accounts like the auto IRA for example, but accounts where the individual makes the choice when to retire and um, and and the, and the individual can plan for what the individual uh, might need in retirement because there will be more predictability about what they can expect from Social Security. But then um, individuals will make those kinds of choices because it's their own money, it's their own account. Um, and uh, and we'll, I think we would get better results. Two things spring to my mind, one on the tax side and one on the benefit side. Um, on the tax side, 
Um, can I contribute to my 401k? I, um, I pay social security tax on that contribution. But when I contribute to my FSA from child care expenses or health care expenses, I don't. And um, you know, I don't think there's a strong po policy rationale for that choice. And just changing that so that my FSA contributions were subject to uh, the Social Security payroll tax would close 10% of the solvency gap. So it's not a huge change, but it's something that could make a significant impact on solvency. So that's one um, tax option I think um, is worthy of considering. And on the benefit side, um, I think it makes sense to maybe take another look at spouse benefits. That you know, when Social Security uh, spouse benefits were first established in 1939, and the American family was different. And I think that maybe taking a look at how we calculate spouse benefits, whether maybe we should um, shift the emphasis away from a marriage-based benefit and maybe toward a, a caregiving type of credit for if we want to have a you know family benefit. I think you know there are some interesting options uh, in that area where maybe we could trim the spouse benefit and then it you know establish some kind of uh, caregiving benefit, which uh, Secretary Clinton has been talking about uh, on the campaign trail. So I think you know there are a lot of interesting new ways of rethinking it uh, while we open it up in sort of uh, in terms of our modern family and modern society. The, um, the bipartisan policy center have um, this retirement security report that. Um, Ken Conrad and, and Jim Lockhart uh, headed, and they have an interesting but very technical idea called mini PIA. The short version is this. Under the current system, if you work 34 years making $50,000 a year, the system treats you the same as if you work 17 years making $100,000 a year. So it doesn't differentiate based on how many years you work. And that means two things. One, it's treating some very wealthy people as not quite as wealthy, and two, it's not as good a work incentive, which matters a lot more if we make a more progressive benefit. So uh, the Bipartisan Policy Center adopts this mini PIA, which instead treats every year the same uh, and, and calculates the benefit, the progressivity of the benefit that way. I don't think you should do that by itself because it, it creates some weird quirk for short career workers, but in concert with other changes, particularly the types that BPC did to make the benefit formula more progressive. Uh, this is one of those rare opportunities to be both fairer, more pro-work, and more progressive all at the same time. Just uh, one last question. Um, there, uh, polls have suggested that uh, a lot of people in their 20s and early 30s just don't expect Social Security to be there for when they retire. Um, I think that probably has to do with sort of broader thoughts on what it is these days and anything else. But um, would just shoring up Social Security long term, like like you did 35 years ago, and, um, would that, do you think that would make people more confident, or is there more there are broader issues at play here about what, what, what we can expect? I think one of the key things to contribute to this is the use of the term bankrupt. And that Social Security is going to go bankrupt. In some and, and people, when they hear that, they think, oh, and if a company goes bankrupt, they close the doors and then that and you operate. So there, I think there's genuine confusion, really misinformation uh, being pumped out there about it. Um, and nonetheless, it would support more Social Security and, and Younger people are not different. Um, it, it, it was understood how it all comes together. No, I mean, yeah, but it, well, we see that when they do get the information, they basically support just a similar approach. Yeah, and I think that's really a testament to your approach that when you actually educate people about what these terms mean, you know, even insolvency, I think, is a pretty opaque term to many people. Um, and they don't understand what all of this means. And when you when they do understand what it means, they, they're very reasonable and they're very common sense about things. Um, but I, I do, I agree with you too that I think it's not just ignorance that's driving those um, opinions. I think it's also a misinformation. I think there's been a lot of misleading misinformation um, and particularly among young people and it doesn't serve us well. I think it's, it's much harder to solve a problem if you think it's overwhelming. If you understand that the problem is manageable and that we can make some modest changes like the ones that people supported in your survey, then you're much more willing to tackle it. So I don't think that this information is really helping having a really informed, yeah. good debate. When, when we, we have tried doing this in, in group situations, and we also get feedback from people uh, who uh, go through the process from the citizen cabinet panel. And the most common response is, oh, that wasn't that hard. What's the problem? Why, 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 why? Clear? Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, so, it, 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 but you're right. If it, if it seems so daunting and overwhelming, it's then, then people that kind of cringe from it. So, I want to be a little contrarian. Uh, 
people say they don't believe Social Security is going to be there. I don't think that people on average actually believe that Social Security is not going to be there. They're certainly not saving as if they believe Social Security is not going to be there. I mean, when you look at their actions, they think Social Security is going to be there, I believe. Um, but there's a lack of confidence and there's a un huge uncertainty about how it's going to be there and what's going to look like. And um, in that sense, almost no matter how we perform Social Security, if we make it solvent for, you know, for a sustained period of time, I would argue 75 years and beyond, but we could fight over that. Um, I, I think there's going to be a huge positive benefit in people's certainty, both kind of an emotional benefit and economic benefit and a political benefit. And so um, for that reason alone, it'd be worth it to do this sooner rather than later. Is after one. So um, I'd like to thank you. Yeah, I can wrap it up. Thank you, Bernie. Uh, just real quick, yeah, we're short on time. I'd love to continue this discussion. On behalf of the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget, I just want to thank everybody, Bernie. Thank you for moderating our panel. So it's fantastic. Thank you. For our